Uh, this part of the, of the um, conference is listed on your program as a keynote, but we decided we'd just go a little bit in a different way and hold it as a, a conversation. We're really, really delighted to have with us um, as our keynote conversationalist, uh, Elton Anglada. Uh, he's, uh, he comes from the Philadelphia Defenders Association, which is, some of you may know, some of the most progressive work is being done right now uh, in the Philadelphia court system. Um, Elton is a senior trial attorney in the juvenile unit of the Philadelphia uh, Defenders Association. Uh, we've had the uh, head of the, uh, the Defenders Association here at various different conferences, Keir Bradford, and uh, they really have a lot to say and a lot to tell us, a lot to tell the rest of the country about what they're doing. Um, Elton's full bio is in the uh, program, uh, so I won't repeat it, but I'll turn the mic over to Joe, who's going to engage Elton in conversation. And don't worry about eating. It's, it's, it may be impolite in some, in some circles, but for us, eat, listen, enjoy. So hi, everybody. Um, this is not necessarily um, anything you'll have to take um, notes on. So you can just go ahead and eat and, and relax. And hopefully, this will be like a good radio conversation. <clears throat> I asked Elton to come here today because he has, um, not, be, not because of, of his um, kind of sterling career in juvenile justice, but because he has such a unique um, um, insight into a lot of things that are on the periphery of juvenile justice. And you'll see what I'm talking about when we get to some of the topics. So he's been listening this morning. And so the first thing I'm going to ask him to do is talk about um, this is particularly relevant to, uh, because of the last panel, to talk about data, policy, and the actual implications of how the data and the policy are implemented. And I mean, th th I, th I thought the, the discussion about parole officers was pretty astounding in terms of their ill-preparedness to, um, to be part of, of a system that's more and more Relating, um, uh, relying on on the uh, what we're learning from from science and behavioral science. So, um, you want to talk? Uh, you want to start with that, please. Thanks, Joe. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Joe, for inviting me here to John Jay. I was here a few years ago. I love this school. I love the facility, and I love the work that you all are doing here. Uh, when you say I have a unique perspective, that's a kind way of putting it. Uh, often what I find is that my opinions seem to annoy people both on the right and the left. Uh, and I'm not always sure why. I often feel like I'm very alone in my positions. And, uh, and that's probably going to be the truth of the case uh, today during lunch also. Uh, I wanted to just tell you a couple things about um, me because it informs my opinions. Uh, I've, I've been a, a public defender for 25 years, my entire career, most of it defending juveniles. Uh, I am primarily a trial lawyer, but I also spent the last decade working as the chief of the juvenile unit at the Philadelphia Defender Association and also working with, the, uh, with JDAP, which is the Juvenile Defender Association of Pennsylvania. We have another board member here who will be on the next panel for JDAP. And JDAP is a state version, a small, modest state version of the NJDC. In other words, a, a statewide organization of juvenile defenders whose goal it is is to improve juvenile justice for juveniles. And in that capacity, I've had the opportunity to do a lot of uh, policy work both uh, statewide and regionally in the Northeast. Uh, but my main focus is as a trial lawyer, and, uh, and and the question that Joe asked me as I was listening to the speakers this morning, and I know Marshall Levick for years, uh, and Kim Dvorak, and uh, and I, and I, the data is true. When 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 Marsha says if we stop collecting data, then we just don't address the issue. When she's talking about how OJJDP just announced that they're no longer going to collect data on disproportionate minority contact, that is horrific. That's code for them saying, we don't care about that anymore. That's what that means. We don't care about disproportionate minority contact. Where they can say all they want about, well, we're diverting this to public safety. That's just a polite way of saying, we don't give a crap anymore about disproportionate minority contact, which is horrific, right? So when Joe originally reached out to me and said, you know, talk about uh, juvenile justice reform, uh, in the Trump administration, and that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about. I turned to my office mate and I said, that's an oxymoron, right? Juvenile justice reform in the Trump administration. What, is, what does this look like? It doesn't, the landscape is bleak. 
Uh, there were some comments earlier at earlier sessions about funding being cut, both on the state and national level. Uh, NJDC and other uh, organizations are having their budgets cut. But one thing that I wanted to focus on, uh, because you all are reporters and, and, and journalists, and I'm an attorney, and we both share something in common in that we barter in language, right? What, we're all, what our lives are about, yours in a slightly different way, and mine is the rhetoric, uh, the art of rhetoric, about, about the precise use of language. And where I often, so often see all the data going wrong is where it goes in the weeds is in, in the misuse of language or different people meaning uh, using the same word to mean different things so that we you get lost it, it, it results don't happen uh, i can't tell you how many times i go into courtrooms or go into jails or go into uh probation offices and i don't see the results that we're supposed to be seeing i'll give you a couple of examples there, there was a discussion at the last panel about trauma Trauma-informed care, right? That's a whole body of science. I've had Sandy Bloom come speak to juvenile defenders all across Pennsylvania about the, the science of trauma-informed care. She certifies, her organization certifies uh, service providers as uh, being trained in trauma-informed care. And yet when I go to those juvenile jails, when I go to Glen Mills, when I go to St. Gabe's, when I go to YDC Louisville, when I walk in the doors, I ask myself, where's the trauma-informed care? I don't see it. It's not happening here. What's going on? And they say, well, you know, we're, we're certified. We're, we're, we've got trained. We're certified in, in trauma-informed care. So you know, the data is great. The, the theories are fantastic. But what often happens is that in real life, it doesn't happen. And why isn't it happening in trauma-informed care? Well, in part, it's a fiscal problem, which is that uh, turnover at these facilities is huge So because they, they have to pay their employees very little so that they can compete and get the bids. That means that if, even if you train their entire staff within six or nine months, no one who's there was even trained in trauma-informed care because the turnover is so high. And more importantly, when I talk to the staff about trauma-informed care, they would say to me things like, well, we do trauma-informed care. But to them, you know what trauma-informed care means to them, to the service providers? It means making sure that their workers aren't traumatized working with our clients. I'm not kidding you, right? That's what they, because a small part of trauma-informed care actually deals with the trauma that we as service providers and we as lawyers, because it is traumatic to butt your, bang your head against the wall every day representing juveniles who have committed horrible things or are getting railroaded by the system and dealing with disproportionate minority contact. It is traumatic, and it can be traumatic for workers. But that's not really what the main thrust of trauma-informed care is about, right? The main thrust of trauma-informed care is to make sure that the kids aren't further traumatized by the system that we put them in because they come into the system already deeply damaged. Uh, and yet when I talked to workers, what I saw was a focus on, oh yeah, we're making sure that our workers aren't traumatized working with these kids. And it, this, it, and I think about you guys as, as journalists and reporters because this is just, they're play, it's, it's semantics, right? They're playing with the language. Yeah, we're doing trauma-informed care, except that the same words mean something different to them. So, uh, isn't it all about uh, the problem with throughout the criminal justice system is about culture and changing culture and having and, and having the time to do that and recognize that it often takes eight or ten years of a, if you have a really good leader to make that happen uh, yes uh, it, 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 it Change moves with glacial haste in this business, right? It's, uh, it, it happens very slowly. Steps are incremental. Uh, but uh, having said that, there are definite signs on the horizon that, uh, as someone mentioned earlier today, that, the, horizon, that the, the, the pendulum is shifting the other way with regard to juvenile justice, with regard to uh, incarceration of juveniles, with regard to trying juveniles. Yes. Arrests are down, but that doesn't mean that the way the juveniles who are arrested, uh, that are currently being arrested, are being treated better. And in fact, now that we, where I again, I'll mention it again, where I feel like we get lost is in what the words mean. So that rather than, uh, like for example, today there was a discussion about somebody, a couple of very good questions about uh, school resource officers, SROs they're called. That's a term, by the way, that I forbid my staff from even using in court. You're not allowed to say school resource officers at the Philadelphia Public Defender. They're not school resource officers. What is the resource? Getting arrested? How is that a resource? They're school police officers. Who came up with that term? That term was created by people who wanted to 
apply a lesser standard of proof to those police officers that rather than needing probable cause, let's say they need only reasonable suspicion. So let's call them something better. It's semantics. And so I will not buy into the argument that they are school resource officers. When I go in court and I make a motion to suppress, or my lawyers argue for motions to suppress, we're talking about school police officers. I don't consider arresting juveniles a resource. I don't think that they are a resource to the school. Mike pointed out that in schools that have school resource officers, arrests are up. And, and duh, who didn't see that coming, right? I mean, if there's police around, more kids are going to be arrested. And that is why we have to pay attention to the language. And I think often we lose the fight, we lose the battle, we get, we get, we get taught, caught up in, in adopting their language. No, let's not call them school resource officers. They're not that. They're school police officers. You want to apply a probable cause standard to them, then let's call them what they are. They're cops. So what's your... What's your this is just an obvious question, but um, what do you suggest journalists um, do when they when they when when they are, are looking at these kinds of terms and what they're supposed to what's, what they're supposed to do? Uh, just take a harder look and say what's going on here. Well, uh, look, I, I don't buy into the you know the, the theory that some put forward that that journalists or the media control the news, and I, that's not I'm not I don't believe that. I think that that the, the journalists and reporters report that news, which is uh, important and what people want to hear, right? I mean, I don't believe that uh, the, that in this whole kind of notion that CNN or or the liberal media is somehow controlling the news. I I, I don't subscribe to that. And uh, Frank, I think I think it's all poppycock. But uh, uh, I think it's also important, though, that we not that we be very careful about the language we use. You have to be very careful because you can you can get in, in, indoctrinated or in, 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 use their language without even knowing it. For, for example, the discussion about, as I mentioned before, about uh, about school resource officers. You have to be very careful. Just the, the when you adopt their terms. You, in law school, the first thing that they teach us is one of the things is 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 how to do an appellate brief, and that what they teach us to do is it, it's two sides, right? It's the appellant and the appellee, and they both have to make a, a statement of the issue, and both sides will state the issue completely differently. It's for you guys, it's the headline, right? What is the headline of your story? What is the the story? What how, the headline is so crucial, and and for defense counsel or for prosecution for lawyers, how you state the issue is is crucial. So. We share that in common, but we have to be more careful or we are going to lose. Right now, I feel like the Trump administration and like the right is setting the agenda, they're setting the tone, and we're responding to them. I mean, uh, uh, we're gonna talk, I think, in a minute about the current nominee for the Supreme Court, and I, and I think this is another example, in fact, this was kind of the thrust of my presentation today, about where language is getting us into the weeds and where we're gonna lose. Well, let's, let's then take a... Let's take a look at what's going on with, uh, with, with Brett Kavanaugh and uh, his um, likely ascension to the Supreme Court. And I'm, and I'm wondering uh, how this, this argument um, about what, what, what Kavanaugh did when he was 16, 17, 18, and 19 kind of <laughs> flies in the face of the, uh, of the doctrine that we've been talking about all morning of adolescent development. Well, Joe, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, when you originally uh, approached me a couple months ago about speaking here as a keynote, I had presented a whole different presentation. And then as I watched the uh, Kavanaugh hearings unfold, I think to myself, well, this is, you know, looking forward to Trump administration and juvenile justice reform. And here we have Brett Kavanaugh. This is kind of uh, custom made for, for the topic, right? Uh, it is pretty much impossible to discuss juvenile justice reform today in 2018 without talking about adolescent development and the doctrine of adolescent development and adolescent brain development because this is in many ways the most positive developments in juvenile justice reform that we've seen in the last 20 years. And I think Marsha and others made, uh, spoke about it at some length this morning on the panel about how strides have been made and how there is even possibilities of further advancing the doctrine of adolescent development to perhaps move the age from 18 up to 19 or 20 or 21 even, uh, that we're going to uh, preempt either JLWAP, Juvenile Life Without Parole, I'll use the acronym if you'll forgive me, or uh, um, Juvenile Executions. Uh, that whole line of cases, here's the thing about this line of cases that, that I think is important. Uh, they start basically in 2005 with a case named Roper v. Simmons. 
And uh, this isn't a law class, but uh, I want to talk about Simmons for a minute because I think it's important to talk about that case. Uh, a lot of people talk about Roper v. Simmons. Not very many people know the facts of Simmons. And the facts of Simmons are important in the context of what's happening right now. Chris Simmons in, uh, in 19... Uh, excuse me, I forget the year it happened, in 1998, I believe, had, uh, he was 17 years old, and he broke into a woman's home. He hogtied her with duct tape, a woman named Shirley Crook. He hogtied her with duct tape, and him and his friend drove her in a pickup truck to a railroad bridge over a river and then threw her in the river. I mean, it's the most horrific crime you could imagine. The facts of Roper v. Simmons are horrific. And yet, when that case went up to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said, juveniles have the capacity for change. They also should be viewed differently in the context of punishment because they have uh, different abilities in their brain to process information, to make decisions, that they make bad decisions, that they underestimate risks, they overestimate uh, rewards, and that uh, they basically cited the science of adolescent development. Uh, they talked about a, a national consensus uh, to, to not execute juveniles and what they called uh, evolving standards of decency. The facts are horrific, and the reason that it, you say, why do you take a case like that? Well, because if you're not going to execute Chris Simmons because what he did with that when he was 17, then clearly no one is really eligible for the death penalty under this standard, right? Uh, that standard has been developed and, and expanded to include JLWAP cases. Uh, the reason I mention it, and I'll get to this in a minute, is because clearly the courts pick the worst case scenario in terms of behavior when they thought about adolescent development and how we're going to look at it. In the whole world, you, me, all the journalists, everybody out there is watching the Kavanaugh hearings right now, and we all have an opinion. Yes, he did it. No, he didn't. Yeah, she's lying. He's lying. He did it, but it shouldn't count. He did it, but it should count. What about his response? Does his response show that he's uh, not fit to sit? We're, you know, we're, all, we're all kind of focusing on this. And I'm horrified. I'm horrified. First of all, I'm horrified because, not that my opinion matters, but I'm horrified because I believe her, and I think that he did these things, so that's horrifying to me. But that aside, my opinion doesn't count. What I say, you know whose opinion counts? The Supreme Court's opinion counts. The Supreme Court's opinion about uh, adolescent development counts here. And so, so does anybody want to um, um, take a different point of view than, than what, what um, Elton is saying? Does anybody want to disagree with that? Smart. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we all see the contradiction, but yet, you know, I, I think many of us here um, are appalled that this guy will be on the Supreme Court. But in light of what Elton is saying, it, it's, um, it really adds another perspective to it, does it not? If I may just finish where, what, what I'm worried about in terms of uh, juvenile justice reform here. Uh, I, there were a, a dozen extraordinarily good reasons to not nominate, much less confirm, Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. Right? Reasons that have to do with, for example, his view on executive privilege and executive power, which are basically just wrong as a matter of law, because Kavanaugh clearly doesn't understand the distinction between president and king. Right? When you say that the president can't be subpoenaed, you are basically giving the legal definition of a king, a person who's above the law. And so there are real legitimate reasons. And I, look, I get it. To the victor go the spoils. I'm not saying, you know, I'm like crying in my, in my suit because, you know, a conservative won and therefore they get to appoint it. That's not the point. Appoint a Supreme Court justice. That's true. The, he does. But you still have to appoint somebody who's qualified. But instead, what happened in this media frenzy, in, 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 and I got it. It's a good story because let's face it. Kavanaugh's misunderstanding about executive power and executive privilege is not a particularly interesting story, right? First of all, it's very legal heavy. It's not something that, that has, that's, you could put that on CNN, and I've seen, the, I've seen the, 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 the talking heads debating it, but that doesn't play like a, a Me Too case coming up at the penultimate moment, right? The, you know, uh, w which is what we have now, which is a much bigger um, uh, story. So rather than focusing on the real reasons uh, uh, the real reasons, on, on legitimate reasons, legal reasons why Kavanaugh shouldn't be on the Supreme Court. We've now gotten into a debate about, about whether or not this incident 
35 years ago should preclude him from the Supreme Court and or his response to the, to the accusations. And what I worry about, what I worry about is that, you know, I tell my friends, and I, you know, when I argue with strangers on Facebook or whatever about this, that, uh, you know, use your head. We're writing Kavanaugh's majority opinion when he overrules uh, these cases. You know, he, remember, Kavanaugh's replacing Kennedy. You know that uh, Roper and uh, Graham and Miller were all 5-4 decisions penned by guess who? Two of them by, by Kennedy. And I think of myself, because I've done some appellate work, when this case goes, and, and, and Marsha made the point earlier, these cases are going to go back up to the Supreme Court. And I think about myself standing in front of Justice Kennedy on the Supreme Court three years from now or four years from now, arguing to Justice Kennedy that, Justice excuse me, Justice Kavanaugh, I apologize, arguing to Justice Kavanaugh, his replacement, Kennedy's replacement, arguing to Justice Kavanaugh that, that my client, you shouldn't revisit uh, Graham, you shouldn't revisit Miller, you shouldn't revisit Roper, that my client should be treated differently because he's a juvenile, then we don't want to hold the juvenile responsible for this entire life for something he did 35 years ago. I want to say that, to say that with a straight face to Brett Kavanaugh and see what answer you get, right? I mean, I think that when we make this argument, what we're doing is we're laying the groundwork. We're writing his majority opinion for, for, for the reversal, for the, for the overruling of, of, of Graham, Miller, and, and Roper. I'm terrified. Never mind J. Elwap cases. I, I, I don't think this guy, it'll come in pieces. You know, well, maybe if you're 18 and you kill four cops, you may well make an exception, you know, or 17 and you kill, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll make little exceptions, just like that, that's how they do it. That's what they're going to do with a lot of cases. So uh, the irony being that while we got, we collectively got kind of lost in the weeds, as I keep saying, that, uh, focusing on this issue, let's make, uh, unless more allegations come up between now and the vote, and I, and I keep holding my fingers. But by the way, what a kind of a, I found myself all week wishing that more, that more accusations would come up and also thinking to myself, God, isn't that sad that I have to actually wish that somebody else was abused by Brett Kavanaugh so that they can come forward with this, right? That's so that, because I saw that as the only thing that perhaps might sink his nomination. In the absence of that, he's going to get on the Supreme Court, and he will be the the new vote, right? Losing Scalia was already a minority vote, but Kennedy was the person who penned these cases, and we're going to lose him, and we're going to have Kavanaugh in his place, and I bet you he's going to be pretty pissed off about how we all tried to derail his nomination with something he did when he was 17, and I don't think that's going to play well for adolescent development cases when they come up in front of the court. Okay, so let's go on to a to final question, and then we'll open it up for questions from you guys. Um, so um, you had mentioned that that we're not proper, properly addressing the competency of juveniles when they're when they're placed in the system. Yeah, I wanted to talk a minute about competency uh, because one of the things that I didn't hear any panels talk about today is that competency is an issue that comes up often with juveniles, especially when we have younger juveniles, 10, 11, and 12-year-olds, and it's not addressed properly. Uh, uh, juveniles, uh, are, are, the competency law was originally developed to address adults that are either uh, what used to be called mentally retarded or cognitively impaired or, juvenile, or adults that are suffering from severe mental illness like schizophrenia, and that frankly the adult law of competency competency does not translate well to juveniles. And, and uh, when I talk to my lawyers in our office about competency, I actually, we have a short training video. Brian, could you, Brian, could you uh, show that, it's the lipstick video. If you could just show this. I don't know if we're going to be able to see it with the, with the blinds open now. Yeah, um, well, let's see if we can see it. It's only about 30 seconds long. What's on your face? What's on your face? Orange. Lipstick? Is that mommy's lipstick? Uh, yes. Yes? I thought mommy asked you not to touch your lipstick. Call daddy. Call daddy? Uh. And what should I tell him? No, not in the bed. Okay, no, Joe, hold, stop it for a second, Brian. So, uh, th th this uh, young defendant here has been charged with uh, theft, <laughs> receiving stolen property, uh, and uh, criminal mischief, right, with uh, uh, basically uh, graffiti with the, with the uh, lipstick on her face. Uh, and it's, there's a couple of interesting points about this. Uh, has she actually been, uh, this is a joke, right? Yeah, it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any 
She's a little too young to be charged. She's, uh, uh, but, but, but it makes an interesting point here and I, uh, about, about competency, right? Because first of all, there's a couple of very, it's a, a great point for, for, for teaching young lawyers because what does she do when, uh, first of all, should the, uh, the, the, the police officer who's questioning her, which is my wife, uh, have Mirandized her first, right? Because is this custodial interrogation? Is, is this defendant free to leave? Well, she can barely walk, so I think she's probably not free to leave. Uh, uh, and, and, and as we know from the JDB case, which is another adolescent development case, we're now going to look at custodial interrogation in the eyes of a juvenile. She probably should have been Mirandized, but what does she do? She invokes her right to counsel, which I just think is brilliant. She says, call daddy, right? Not once, but twice, right? Unequivocally, she invokes her right to counsel, and we know under the law that when a juvenile or an adult invokes their right to counsel, they're all questioning that must stop. And that anything that follows after that must be um, suppressed. So in this case, I tell the lawyers, you clearly have to file a motion to suppress. And in fact, you see that the police officer here continues the questioning, even though she's invoked her and is asking questions that are designed to uh, elicit an incriminating response. <laughs> Don't you know that you're not supposed to touch the makeup or the lipstick? And she continues to ask the questions. But what was the answer to the one question? What should I tell daddy? And she says, um, uh, basically, it's almost like you can hear it. She says, monkeys in the bed, which is a reference to that song about uh, monkeys jumping in the bed, and, uh, which made me think really very, very soon about competency, right? Is she even competent? She's really not competent. She's only it's certainly to be, to be a, a defendant. But in the context of 8 and 9 and 10 and, and 12 and tw uh, 10 and 11, 12-year-olds, you will get answers that are not so different from this. A lot of 10 and 11 and 12 year olds who've been arrested by police do not really understand what's going on, are not able to uh, participate in their own defense, uh, don't under understand how to re respond or, or deal with or interact with police in, in ways that uh, pr protect their rights. Uh, so the system, what happens if a, if a juvenile is declared incompetent is that in our jurisdiction and in many jurisdictions, the juveniles just languish. Because the law, the adult law of, of competency states that we that we basically wait to see if the person can be if competency can be restored. But in the context of juveniles, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Juveniles often never were competent and never will be competent, especially if we're dealing with cognitive impairment. So uh, this is an issue that has has to be addressed and focused on. Uh, I saw Marianne Scally nodding her head when I mentioned competency because it is a problem. And we have kids right now in the system, 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds who just sit, it's not, if, if a court declares you're incompetent, it's not as if they just say, okay, charges are dropped, go home, see you later. You stay in the system. You may be put into the dependency system, but you're basically institutionalized, and the, the prosecutors will wait 6, 12, 18, 24, 36 months to see uh, if, the, if competency can be attained or restored. Uh, and I've given, and I'm not going to talk right now because I, you know, there's neither time and there's also a panel about this, but we see what the Trump administration is doing with separating juveniles from adults just as a basically as a, a, a negotiating tool to discourage people from crossing the border. And much to my chagrin, it's actually apparently having some success. So they can not only do it, but they can claim, see, it works. Of course it works. So it doesn't make it any less brutal or horrific, right? The, uh, that, that the Trump administration is not particularly um, sympathetic to or, or, or kind uh, about the plight of children in the juvenile justice system. Yeah, we, we have, we're, we're going to have a, <clears throat> a panel tomorrow about what's, what's going on at the border. She did because uh, she called, daddy was called. It, yeah, I, I, took, I, I told her to, uh, I, I, what I told my wife was, um, I, first of all, I told uh, Felicity to stop talking immediately, not to say anything. Uh, and then I, I, I told my wife that, because my wife showed me the video and I told my wife that I had already filed a motion to suppress the, her, her inculpatory statements and that it would certainly be granted under laws in every state in the nation. That she had every obligation, every require every duty to stop questioning after the defendant in, impl inst implicated her uh, Fifth Amendment right to counsel. All right, so anybody have a question? For, yes, go ahead, please. Can you repeat that? One Wait. second, please. Kelly, say your... Okay. Um, Kelly Davis, I'm a freelance reporter from San Diego, and actually the story I'm working on for this project is on juvenile comp restoration to competency. Um, oh, great. And four, I think four states do have competency laws are a, a system in place? Is anyone doing it right? Or is there a program that, that can be used as a model for? 
other places? Well, when you say have uh, some sort of system of competency laws in place, uh, every state has laws about competency. Or I, I, or I guess that have separate a separate a juvenile system. specific competency. Yeah. Uh, we don't have that in Pennsylvania, and I'm not familiar with uh, the research on that. I do know that in Pennsylvania we're doing it wrong. That what's happening in my jurisdiction is that juveniles are basically de deemed incompetent, and then they just languish in the system. They sit there, and the cases get three months, six month reviews. We come back, and uh, then there's arguments about whether or not uh, the child has, is now competent. Uh, and either way, the child is basically in a bad position. If the child is not competent, the child remains in the placement that they're in. If they are competent, now the, the Commonwealth will now seek to prosecute them. Uh, so. Uh, I don't see, uh, in my mind, as a criminal defense lawyer, what should happen if a child is incompetent is that the, that the, the, the here's the thing about competency evaluations. A, a properly done competency evaluation is supposed to make a determination about whether, in that expert's opinion, in that forensic expert's opinion, competency can be attained or restored. I much prefer the word attained rather than restored, because restored suggests that at some point in the past your client was competent, and, and often in the, with my clients that's not the case. So I will object to the word restored. Again, going back to this issue about the use of language, right? Um, if you concede a discussion about whether or not competency can be restored, what you're basically conceding implicitly is that your client was competent before, and I'm not willing to give them that. Uh, so I will object to any evaluation that talks about restoration of competency or about prosecutors talking about restoring competency. In my case, it's about attainment of competency. Uh, okay, so we're running out of time. I want to ask you, I want to ask you uh, two questions. What's the, what's the biggest fallacy about the criminal justice system really getting better? Is there a fallacy, or is that really the truth? Well, well what is the thing that's not getting better? You, you, you know, many things are getting better uh, because there's a lot of very motivated people who care a whole lot. Some of them, some of them are sitting in this room right now. Uh, working very hard to make things better, and inroads have been made. The work that Bob Listenby has done, and the work that NJDC has done, and the work that JLC has done, bears real fruit uh, across the country. It's also true that when you go into the courtrooms and you see what's going on, a lot of it is still the same old song. So the frustration for me, it, or, or it, uh, I see the fallacy is, for example, in the context of waiver hearings, and this was talked about a lot earlier in the day, and I was gonna talk about waiver, transfer, certification, it goes under different names. There's a whole body of law about it, and there's different ways to do it, and I teach it in my juvenile justice class at Drexel, and it's all very interesting, but what happens when you go into the courtrooms in Pennsylvania is, outside of Philadelphia, that in most of the counties, what's going on is that the lawyers are just waiving the issue. They're not even litigating it. They're just letting their clients be uh, tried as adult without even litigating the issue. So all the work that, that, that Marianne Scali or the JLC or that Bob Listenby at OJJDP or that I've done through JDAP, it doesn't matter. If, if the lawyers are just going to stand up there and waive the issue and say, uh, try him as an adult because that's how it's done in that courtroom and that's how it's done in that county and that's how they do it or because if they make an issue about it, they're going to fall in disfavor with the judge or whatever, whatever either it's either fear or because it's the practice, then all of this research and work doesn't mean a hill of beans, right? And that's the problem. And, that, and I've talked to Marianne Scali about this on many times, the, the frustration about going out nationally and trying to educate people and train people and then when you get out into the, into the court rooms, what you see what's happening makes you want to cry. Okay, Thanks. anybody else that has any questions? All right, we'll take this as a last question. Sure. Maybe short question. Well, I don't know if you could answer this one too quickly, and sorry if you've answered this many times already. Um, I'm from Philadelphia, uh, where uh, I grew up in the Lynn Abraham era. She was kind of a famously pretty uh, strict uh, prosecutor. So um, I I'm wondering, how has the Larry Krasner era lived up to your hopes? Uh, where has it not lived up to your hopes? <laughs> Inside baseball, you can discuss. Well, I think it's actually a nationally. I, I can answer that quickly. Yeah. First of all, you, uh, you may be interested in knowing that uh, I was so impressed with the work that Larry Krasner is doing along with Bob Listenby, who's his first assistant chief, that I, uh, I I took a job with them and was about to become a DA. I was supposed to start on July 27th and work with the with Larry and Bob as, as, a, as a district attorney in Philadelphia. And after mulling it over for a month, I just couldn't do it. And I called them up and said, I'm a PD at heart. I can't be a DA. You're doing great things. I love what you're doing, but I'm not, I can't be part of that. So uh, I admire what they're doing. And I think that uh, their, their efforts are bearing a lot of fruit and have real, made real significant changes in how people are being prosecuted in Philadelphia. 
uh, having said that, I've often, I often uh, say, say in my office, I told Kier the other day, you know, I'm glad you're all feeling the love, but I got to tell you, in juvenile, we're not feeling the love yet. So the, it hasn't actually trickled down so much on the juvenile side. I had a meeting yesterday, a meeting I had lunch with Bob Listenby yesterday, and talked to him about these concerns, and he told me that they're in the process of making changes in, some, in their juvenile unit and for me to, to be patient. So I believe that there are going to be changes in how they approach the juvenile justice end of it also in Philadelphia. That was not their priority. I think they started with homicide, and we're working their way through other areas. But uh, so far, we haven't felt the love in juvenile, but I think we're going to soon. So this uh, Philadelphia then would be a really good uh, a place for, for our reporters from around the country to take a look at, see what they're trying to do, see the problems that they're encountering and what they're actually accomplishing. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that uh, especially if you are inclined, and I hope you all are, to give uh, Larry Krasner uh, positive publicity because he gets a fair amount of negative publicity, please come to Philadelphia and sing his praise because he's doing amazing things down there. He's not the only one. There's some other, I think there's a, a prosecutor, I believe, in Dallas is doing some similar work in, in, in other places. That, but there has been some really, uh, what's happening in Philadelphia is so monumental, so so newsworthy and so innovative that I was ready to leave a career of 25 years as a public defender just because I wanted to be part of it. I mean, it's really that, uh, that monumental. So yeah, come to Philadelphia and talk about it. He was our keynote speaker okay, a month ago. Thank you very much. I heard that and I think that's fantastic, so. Round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. We're gonna move uh, right to the next panel. Uh, no rest for the weary.